This is Jeffrey Reddick, and you're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John and Pete. Yes, you are. And with us today, we have the honor and the pleasure of uh, Jeffrey Reddick in the house. In the house, indeed. <laughs> uh, the house happens to be Hill's house. We're in the uh, office of Hilliard Guest, who hosts the Screenwriter's Rant Room in this very room. So uh, we better make a good show, because good shows get made at this table. That's what happens. Yeah. No thank pressure. Thank you for... Yeah, really. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> thanks for joining us. No, thanks for having me. I, I think the first thing I want to say is, uh, since you're from Kentucky, we are mourning the loss of Muhammad Ali yeah. this week. Yeah. Yeah. Did you... Now, you grew up in Kentucky? I grew up in Kentucky. And you know, the funny thing is, um, I did not realize that he was from Kentucky till he passed. No kidding. I... Missed that one. I missed that one. Wow. Um, yeah, because I, I grew up like in eastern Kentucky, very, very small town. And, uh-huh. When What's the name like, of the town in Eastern uh, Kentucky? It's Jackson. Okay. Jackson, Kentucky. Actually, I grew up in a little subsection called Athol, which was like probably a twenty minute drive from Jackson, but that uh-huh. was the that was the city I grew up in. So I just never you know, like when we first moved there, like, you know, we finally got T V with like three channels. <laughs> you know, HBO is a big deal, but if it ever snowed and knocked over a wa- you know, the cable, then you know, we had no T V for like a week. So, you know, I would Muhammad Ali was a little before my time. I was, I was, I was very young then. So, I, yeah, I didn't know he was from Kentucky till he passed, and I was like, "Wow, man!" Yeah. There's a lot, a lot of great people come from Kentucky, but he's, um, he just was such a, you know, inspiration and such a, you know, activist and such a peaceful person for being such a for being a boxer. You know, again, just another. I think he just he did Kentucky proud, and he he just um, was a great man. Yeah, it was. I would say he did Kentucky proud indeed. Yeah. I, I would say you have too. Okay. I know we'll embarrass you a little bit. No, 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 I try, I try, you know, I love Kentucky. I love being from there. And, and, um, you know, I, I always joke that, um, when, when people are like, you know, oh, you're a celebrity. I'm like, well, I'm a celebrity in horror conventions and in Kentucky. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Because one could do a lot worse. No, 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 absolutely. No, you know, I work in a genre that I love. And, um, I was, I was funny. I was reading a, a Twitter post from, uh, friend of mine nicole crux today and she was you know talking about how much movies that horror films make but you know we get no respect come award season or anything like that you know so it's it's always funny because i i just love the genre and i it's something that i, I want to stay in but you do get a little annoyed after a while where it's like people kind of still look down on it when it's like it's a, the most profitable genre and there's some really great films that come out of the genre well it's a type of storytelling that we know that is universal i mean we were talking earlier about how Comedy doesn't necessarily translate in some cultures. Right. What's funny here might not be funny in other places. But what scares the shit out of you here will scare the shit out of anybody. That's yeah. true. And yeah. that's one thing that, you know, we can all uh, relate to. And I think the goodness of the horror genre, and for our listeners, if you're just uh, joining and you haven't made yourself familiar with Jeffrey Reddick, you are perhaps best known as the creator of the Final Destination series. You wrote the first one. and Yeah. Exec produced the second one? Yeah. I uh, wrote the original draft of the first one, um, and director James Wong and Glenn Morgan did a, co-wrote it with me as well. So I always like to give them props. But, um, but yeah, that's, you know, my, my claim to fame is, is creating that. And, um, you know, I've done some other genre films as well. Uh, a movie called Tamra, um, mm-hmm. a remake of Day of the Dead, which everybody loves remakes. That was sarcasm a little bit because people hate remakes. Um, <laughs> I've got a, you know, I just finished a, project about sleep paralysis that i wrote in texas and um we're about to cast another horror film and i'm going to hopefully be directing something by the end of the year so staying busy staying busy yeah no it's it's been a this year has been like a very blessed year it's been very 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 good so far we see a lot of remakes in horror why do you think that is you know what i worked at a studio i worked at new line cinema uh for a over 10 years. Oh, and we'll get back to that. Okay. Yeah, that's a great story. I love New Line. Um, our, what New Line used to be, it was like a maverick. You know, talking about mavericks in the industry. The old New Line was definitely a maverick in the industry. And um, I, forgot, I forgot what your question was now. I'm thinking about New Line. I miss it so much. <laughs> <We're> just, <laughs> you, you mentioned that people don't like remakes. Oh. But well, it seems like we see them in well, horror. Well, we see them because um, studios are very risk averse. Mm-hmm. So... Most studios, it's like if something has brand recognition, it's a safer bet. So that's why you see a lot of movies 
you know, you see a lot of, especially out of the studios, you see a lot of sequels and remakes or things that are adapted from books or video games. Um, it's because their rationale is that there's a built-in audience. Yeah. And it's a safer bet. There are enough people who will come back for more of this if the yeah. first one was good. So what about the uh, Vince Vaughn Psycho? Did that make money? I don't think that one made much money. Yeah, I don't um, think that one did especially no. well either. That was, um, but there, you know, it's always a, it's a, fr- it's an interesting thing because fortunately now there's so many other places that you can get your movies out there that you don't have to necessarily go the studio route anymore. Um, the studio route's still a great route to go, but it's, again, if you look at their, Output their you tendencies. Know, most yeah. most of their stuff is really you know tentpole kind of franchise sequel stuff. Right. Um, they make the accountants happy. Yeah, yeah, and it's a, you know and I understand it's a business, but it's it is funny when when people are bemoaning the fact that people aren't writing original stuff. It's like, well, you know, why do you have to write a remake? Why can't you write something original? It's like, well, I've got like fifteen original scripts, and brother got to make rent. Yeah. yeah, that too. But yeah, so but sometimes I, that has to happen. That has but, to happen. But you know, but I have but. Almost all my writer friends, like we all have original material, um, but it's really hard to sell it. You yeah. know, it was hard. It was hard to even working at New Line. It was originally hard to get them to sign off on uh, Final Destination because it was a you know death was a killer, and they're like, how can we? You know, you can't fight it. How how's that going to work? Luckily, when the uh, director came on, they really fought to make sure that we didn't turn it into like a killer, um, and we kept it death. And um, and you know, I knew it would work because we're all afraid of death, and right? You know, that's, you don't have to have, sometimes you don't have to have a physical killer. Like supernatural movies oftentimes don't have a physical killer. Right. There's nothing we're all more afraid of than death. Yeah. And it's almost like, you know, the Steven Spielberg thing where he does the, I'm going to make something really scary and it's going to be big and ominous and it might be a shark or it might be a truck or it might be a dinosaur or whatever. Mm -hmm. But ultimately what it is, is a representation of your life going away. Yeah. Yeah. And so you just went for the raw, let's, you know, hey, we don't have to make it a shark or a truck or right. a, we can make it death. Death will come and get you. Right. If you met, yeah, you can't cheat it. Yeah. Um, and so that's what, you know, I think that's why the franchise has been so durable is it, it, it does because we never did have like a Grim Reaper kind of figure. Right. So that the movie traveled internationally because we didn't put any face to death. So in every country they could just put their own fear of what death is onto that that movie wow so i think that that's really why it has legs and it's it's very interesting because they've done five of them and it's been many years since the sequel's been done but probably in the last like three or four months is articles are like cropping up on all these websites you know talking about it either kind of doing retrospectives on it or saying it's like this is not me saying it. this is an article saying it like it's one of the, an article on one of the uh, the movie sites movie pilot said it was like the the best horror film of the 21st century the 20th century I get my centuries confused. I know, <laughs> I know Buck, it's, it's, it's not Buck Rogers. I don't know which, which century. But um, so it's definitely it's a it's a film that just as a fan because I've I've been a fan of horror films my whole life. You know, it's I'm very proud of it just because I know that it's kind of made a mark. You know, and and and, and that's no kind of thing like oh it's the best horror film ever made. But it's you always want to if you're a horror fan you want to have a film out there that people remember and so sure i don't want to you know i don't want to be milk and final destination for the rest of my life and i you know luckily there's some other stuff coming up now that i think is going to make people very excited but if i were to get hit by a bus today you know i I am happy that i kind of created something that endures that 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 everybody enjoyed so much yeah yeah Yeah, you've got an actual franchise what i love about the horror genre is it's fun your movie is fun you know, yeah. you're like, where is it coming from? You know, what's going to happen? And you can't cheat death, but no. you can think you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And for a little while. Like, that's what's we... playful about it. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. And you can be ridiculous and we'll all make that leap. Yeah. Because oh, it's yeah. death. And he's not, death isn't bound by the rules that a regular character would be. You know, right. like when Jason gets up for the 5,000th time, you're like, all right, well, let's do it again. <laughs> let's jump again. You know, but. You know death will keep getting up. Yeah. Death's like, I don't care. It's sort of like the Terminator. He's like, I'm just going to keep coming. Yeah. And you can accept that. Yeah. So it's cool. I, I, I think it's, I, I just watched, uh, you know, to do prep, I watched the first one again. And it was awesome. I, I knew, I knew that, uh, I knew Stifler was going to die. And I'm like, I don't care. I want to yeah. see it happen. It's yeah. so crazy. It's funny. You're like looking around. They're all trying to figure it out. And all of a sudden, boom, it got figured out right in front of yeah. their face. I love it. Yeah. Let's, it. Can we talk about how you landed at New Line? Because that's such a great story. Yeah, it's a, it's a, um, yeah, I, I, 
I feel like I should bring out a pipe and sit back in my rocking chair <laughs> to tell the tale. That would be it's a good been look. Told, been told many times. But um, when I was 14 years old, I saw um, the original Nightmare on Elm Street movie, which is still my favorite movie of all time. And for all the reasons I love movies, it was smartly written. You know, had a very strong female protagonist, had a great villain, just nightmarish, stuff I'd never seen before. And especially at 14, you know, mm-hmm. that messes your mind. Like you're So... um. I, I went home and I wrote a prequel, um, and I found out the name of the studio from the video box because I saw it at a s- second tier theater, like right before it went to video. And, and I called information and got the address, and so I mailed my prequel to, to Bob Shea. <laughs> this story yeah. involves calling information. I dial popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, well, yeah, no, and I, well, I typed it also on an onion paper on my typewriter. Mm. Wow. And um, never kept a copy of it because you never, you never, when you're that young, you don't think. Like now I'm like, wow, I should have kept that. Like I, yeah. could, I could sell that shit on eBay. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but, um, but no, so I sent it to, I sent it to Bob Shea and um, he wrote me back a kind of a generic, you know, we don't take unsolicited material letter. Now, did he ever see anything at that point or did somebody write you back and it never made um, it to Bob Shea's desk? I, I, you know what? He, I, he, I ended up becoming f- friends with Bob and, and dear, dear friends with um, his assistant, Joy Mann, um, who, um, amazing, amazing woman. Um, she's no longer with us, but um, she took me under her wings early on and got me my first internship at New Line. And I just, she, so blessed to know her. But um, she probably actually wrote me back the first, the mm. first time, you know, saying we don't take unsolicited material because, you know, and Bob signed, the, Bob signed the letter, yeah. you know, but also New Line was very small back then. You mm-hmm. know, this was Nightmare was their big movie. So yeah. they hadn't turned into like this huge mini major yet. So I wrote Bob back and I was like, thank you. But um, I just so you know, I've seen like three of your movies and I've spent like three dollars on your stuff. So I think you can take five minutes to read my story. You can <laughs> read my 120 page. Script no, it wasn't. Even, it was just a treatment. So oh, it was okay. only like it was only like 10 pages or something like that. Uh. And so he read it hold on let's just take a moment to understand the yeah. brashness you know it was like no bob shay let me tell you what's going to happen here yeah i just spent three dollars on your shit man yeah <laughs> i say you sit down and read this treatment because i know what's happening and i speak from the youthful audience now sit down read my read my treatment now that's hillbilly that's kentucky hillbilly for you like uh-huh. i was like no dude i spent i spent three dollars on your on your stuff so you can read my story right and again, you don't think about it because at, at that point, I, I, you're, you're 14. Yeah. So it's like you still think that movies get made by, you know, somebody reads a script and then five minutes later, a movie magically appears. Right. Like you have no bit. So I knew Bob Shea ran the company, but, you know, it's not, you know, he wasn't Bob Shea at that point. Right, right. But, you know, he read it and he got back to me and he, he said, I thank you for your aggressive introduction and you're, <laughs> you're taking the time to write. And he said, you know, you've got a great imagination, but he said, you know, you need to work on story and, and uh structure and so he gave me some actually really good advice and i ended up staying pen pals with um his with joy his assistant um and him too and um, they would send me scripts to read and send me like little tchotchkes for movies and I, that like, is terrific yeah right on bob shea yeah mm-hmm. so um when right i was 19 joy. yeah when i was 19 i moved to new york to study acting for the summer and uh, joy got me an internship at new line um and i ended up trying to act on the side and doing a little bit here and there but Stayed on at New Line as an intern and then finally got on full time at New Line and worked there until after I sold the second uh, Final Destination. A cumulative 11 years. Yep. 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 Wow. And you still have good, solid feelings about it. I mean, it's not like you're like, and then I left and got the hell out of there. No. no, no like, this no. is like your family. No. You no, it was, yeah. No. And it was, you know, it's a, it was a wonderful company. I mean, it, it, unfortunately, you know, as, as happens a lot of times that companies get absorbed into bigger companies. Sure. And so they laid off like all of the New York office where I worked. So everybody I knew was gone and most of the LA office. And, you know, New Line is still there. There's still some great people that, that work there, but it's just a much smaller, mm. very small, you know, kind of company now. So the, the family that I kind of grew up with, you know, they're not, they dispersed. They're dispersed. But, um, no, I, that was the best life experience I could ever get there. And, and, the best people, like, as far as work ethics go. And, you know, this was back during, like, Mike DeLuca's heyday when, you know, again, he was, he's a film lover. Not that he's out of his heyday, but he's a film lover. And he would, you know, push for films like Blade or The Mask or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, things that most people would be like, well, we test marketed this and nobody's going to want to see an African-American vampire hunter. That's stupid. And Mike would be like, no, make this, this movie will make money. And Bob trusted him. Mm. And, that was the kind of spirit of New Line at the time is they didn't go out, you know, they, they would find, you know, they had their, you know, they do house party and they do sure. things for different niches. But um, 
they never, um, I think it's niche, not niches. I'm a writer. Me don't speak um, very well. <laughs> I think you're good either way. <laughs> yeah. On our show, you're good either way. But, um, but you know, they, they would take a lot of chances at New Line, and their chances would pay off in a huge way. And they were very filmmaker friendly, and it wasn't about, you know, well, let's try to hit a four quadrant, make a four quadrant film here that's going to, you know, yeah, it was yeah. about let's just make a movie, good movie, and let's trust our gut here. We have a great script. So that was like the best, you know, you get spoiled working at a place like that because then when the industry changes and gets sure. more corporate right. and originality isn't as rewarded as it, as it used to be. Um, Isn't that funny that the originality is what gets you the profit. The profit is what gets you absorbed. And then once you get absorbed, they suck all the yeah. originality yeah, it's a very, out. It's a very, it's just, a, the, I guess it's a way of the world in yeah. a way. There's, you know, there's, that's why I think it's great that we still have the studios, but we have all these other companies out there now. And you can make a movie, shoot a movie on your iPhone now for crying out loud. They have, it's yeah. It's crazy kids. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, with their 4Ks on their, on their iPhones making yes. the movies. Yeah. Um, so what about now, there you are with an internship in New York at New Line, and you're there for the summer. Please elaborate. What happened next? I was actually, I went to go to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts um, okay. for the summer to study acting. So I was taking acting courses, interning at New Line part-time, and then working at, as a waiter, of course, um, at night to pay the bills and I was staying at a YMCA and um, I actually through my acting class um, uh, I met a, a really nice girl Nicole Dean Checo and I'm probably saying her name wrong but her mother was a casting director I didn't know this at the time um, we just ended up being friends but her mom like started giving me some extra work like on all my children and I was getting extra work in movies and um, I was like oh this acting stuff is easy um, and I got an agent oh boy well yeah that famous last words yeah that 19 year old night, that was a little bit naive there. But, um, so I decided not to go back to school. I decided to stay in New York because I was having some success. And, um, but, the, you know, there came a point where my acting agent was like, well, you know, I just, I don't know what to do with you. She's like, you know, you're, you're an et- kind of like an ethnic Michael J. Fox. And there's not any roles for people like you on the air. Like, if you rapped or played basketball, you know, we could definitely find work for you. But, wow. <laughs> I just don't know what to do with you. And then they canceled the Cosby show. And I'm like, well, there's my only chance to find work in this town. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the only place an ethnic Michael J. Fox is going to be cast. So, you know, they, I decided to start really pursuing the writing um, as a way to get into acting because I'd always wanted to be in the industry. So I was like, well, if I'm not going to be able to kind of go in traditionally, I'll just write stuff for myself. Unfortunately, I write teenagers getting killed and I kept growing up. So I wasn't a teenager anymore. Um, Eventually, you couldn't cast yourself. Yeah, I'm like, I can't play. I can't play jock number one or nerd number three because I'm too old. But yeah, so I decided to to segue into writing, which was my second favorite thing besides acting. And I've been doing that ever since. And I've started producing now and uh, directed a short. I'm going to be directing a feature this year. And, you know, so it's just been an evolution. But I now I've started putting myself in my projects, like just bit parts here and there. Because, they act, you know, if you're bo- kind of born an actor, it never really goes away. Right. Like you can kind of bury it, but it's always there. Um, it's fun anyhow. Hey, it's we fun. Want, we it's want a lot to see of fun. In it. Yeah. But you know, being again 19 in New York, I had read somewhere that it takes 10 years of hard work if you're going to be an artist to start finding success in your field and by success they didn't mean like you're going to be rich and all this, but they just meant even just making a good living at it. Mm-hmm. And you know, I moved to New York in 19 and I'm working background stuff and some a couple lines here and there on like TV shows and you know, interning at New Line Cinema, and I'm like, screw that 10 years thing. Yeah, it's actually, a lot real fast, actually. Yeah, but then it was literally 10 years to the year I graduated that I sold Final Destination. See what yeah. happens? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there yeah. is there is wisdom to that, because the the essence of that message is you have to be willing to commit 10 years of your life right. to your craft. Yeah. And if you're not willing to do that, then you shouldn't be doing this. And, and there's no substitute for hard work, because whoever the Tajik version of Michael J. Fox is, that guy's got the same problem. He's like, there's no rules for guys from Tajikistan. You know, I've got to go out and find one. Right. And I might have to write my own movie or I might have to get good at swinging a camera or whatever. Right. But they've, you've got to do the work. But then you figure out, yeah, you either give up or you figure out a way around the obstacle. And Sure. So that's what I always tell people because I meet a lot of people who are like, well, I'm going to give myself two years. And if I'm not famous by then, I'm like, well, if you're, if you're doing this to be famous, then you might as well just stop right now. This is not a business that you get into to be famous. You know, if fame is what you want hopefully that's a byproduct of your hard work but right. you're you have to be able to you know want to do hard work and act in a lot of stuff and get rejected a lot and you know have your scripts turned down a lot um, there are just a million people in line ahead of you who don't care about that 
Yep. And that's what you're competing with. Yeah. So if what you're going to do is come in here so you can be famous, it's just not going to work. Yeah. Everybody can see through it. And now it's even harder because now you can become famous by flashing your tits on the internet. Okay. You know, so let's all do that right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go to www. Um, <laughs> break it down show tit flash. Oh. Um, it's a pay Quick, site. Secure that <laughs> URL. Over there like he's over it there is. getting the domain name right now. It's a, it's a um, dollar to get on. But you know, it's not, but now it's interesting because back when I was growing up, like hit shows on television had like 18 million viewers, you right. know, because there were only three like networks. Yeah, yeah. And now it's like, you know, a hit show will have two million viewers or a million and a half because the people in it are in the news all the time, you know, and so they're more famous for being famous than for being talented. And, uh, and there are some people that are talented and famous for being famous, but there's a lot more clutter and competition out there. Sure. So you really have to get into this business for the right reasons. Well, a lot of people think it's easier now. You know, we've said this on the show yeah. over and over again. Now that there are several ways to get attention to yourself, there are several zillion people who have just as many ways Absolutely. as everyone else. So. That's the, pr that's exactly, yeah. I, and now it's, it was, a, it used to be that there were gatekeepers who would, you know, man the door and make sure that they're letting in quality and that you had to persevere so that eventually somebody would let you in the door. Right. And now the doors are wide open, but everybody's trying to squeeze through them. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely an interesting time because it's, it's kind of fun seeing like the fame of celebrity where it's just, we're internet stars, but you know, right. then a lot of times, you know, I've seen films where they've cast like internet stars to, and it's not had no effect on like the box office or something because people don't realize that it, that stuff doesn't really translate outside right. the world of the internet. Like if people can watch you 24 seven for free at home on their computer, like they're not going to go out and spend $13 to see you on the big screen. Like sure. it's just, hey, you got a million views on YouTube. That doesn't make you Brad Pitt. Yeah. Yeah. If you like the show and you know you do, send us some pictures of your movies. Don't do that. Support the show. There are three ways you can support us. Number one, go to iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to podcasts and leave a five-star rating and review. It helps with the show metrics and helps us get better placement. Number two, visit our website, www.breakitdownshow.com. We've got an Amazon and an eBay link. Same Amazon, same eBay, you know and love, but they give us a little kickback when you get to their site from ours. And number three, leave comments about the shows that you like. We want to know what you think, how you feel. Tell us how to make the show better. We greatly appreciate it. Now back to the show. We like boobies. So do you think that you're in a position of advantage having done your years and being in, as Hilliard put it, in the system, making big movies? Do you think that for somebody who would try to build a career now that the opportunity to do things yourself on the internet and post your own content allows you better creativity, allows you more expressiveness? Or do you think that the traditional route of going to school and studying and getting a job and working your way up through a studio gives you the type of opportunity that allows you greater resource? Well, the funny thing is I actually, I, I went to college for theater. Um, so I never studied writing or, or film. And I never took any screenwriting course. I just read a lot of scripts and watched a lot of movies. So I definitely think education is important, hugely important. Film schools, I'm not so sure. Like I've had a lot of friends that have spent a lot of money on film schools and they're like, ah, we should use that money to, to make a movie. Sure. So I think the only danger, it's not even the danger is, is, you don't need gatekeepers in a way, but I think a lot of times if you're just putting stuff online for yourself and you don't have anybody, if you're just surrounded by friends who are just like, oh, you're awesome and this is awesome and this is great, then you're not growing. And you're not, you know, once you think you're great, you stop growing as, a, as an artist, not to get all hoity-toity. But so I think a lot of the people that are kind of finding internet fame um, and really all they're doing is like showing videos of them taking their shirts off and going to doing something goofy and, you know, yeah, they're getting paid a lot of money now by people to go to conventions and to be spokesmodels for things. But, you know, they're not really developing, like, a skill set as far as, like, you know, what are they going to do once they get out of puberty or once they hit a certain age? And, and that cute thing isn't cute anymore. That cute thing isn't cute anymore. So yeah. it's like you have, if you if you want to be, like, one of the aw awesome things that, that I was witness to, I'm just 
using weird phrases today for some reason that I was witness to. Um, Say it in, in like a good southern accent, something that I was witness to. Well, something cool that I was, well, <laughs> no, something cool I was witness to was, um, <laughs> no, I gave out a horror award at this, uh, the LA film festival, high school okay. film festival. Oh God, now I'm going to, I got to get the accent out of there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like once it starts coming out, but there were, these were high school students and yeah. a lot of them were in can. It's like, oh, the, B- Billy can't get his award today because he's in can with his short. I'm like, wow. 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 But you saw a lot of the quality of the films and a lot of the stuff was, was really good. And the, the, and some of it wasn't good, but these are high school students. So they're learning and they're going to keep growing. Man, if you're a high school student and you get, Accepting for Billy. Yeah. You know, who, who's <laughs> got an algebra test tomorrow? Can't. No, who's in can <laughs> with his can, short. Right. But the funniest thing was I, I, I spent the night like watching all these films and, um, the one that, that I thought was the best, the one that won the audience award, um, the kid, the group of kids that made it also won like the best, uh, drama, I think. Hmm. And then the audience award film, and it was, I thought it was the best film. And so they got up there to speak and the kids were like, yeah, well, you know, we got all of our equipment and we shot our drama film. And then we realized we had the camera for one more night, so we figured we would just write something and shoot it that night just because we had the camera. And I was like, those little effers, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> because it was really, I mean, that just shows you, like, when you just want to do something to create, sometimes the most original, like, best stuff comes out of there. Because what they shot was brilliant. Like, it was a f- scary, creepy, short, really smart. And a, the idea that they just decided to shoot it in one night and come up with the idea and grab their neighbors to be in it. Um, it came from a place of purity. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's a sweet spot that I think, you know, that's it's where possible. That's where projects come from. It's like any kind of art artist, you know, whether you're a singer or writer or anything, you obviously are influenced by things that you love. Like Nightmare on Elm Street was a huge influence on me and, and Wes Craven and Stephen King and, and Clyde Barker and, and it, you know, the list goes on, but that's the stuff I grew up comic, I comic, huge comic book geek. So all that stuff kind of comes out in a lot of my work. Um, it doesn't always make it to the screen, but it just is in a lot of my work and yeah. kind of the spirit of that stuff. So it's cool seeing like these young kids who are creating as well, but you know, it is coming, like you said, from a place of purity because they're just like, okay, we let's just make something now because we got time and let's just do it. Yeah. And they're not trying to like figure out like, well, what, what's going to sell at the box office or what's going to win us an award? You know, they shot their drama to win the award and they did win the award for it. But the, the one that got the like most votes for like best short of the, mm-hmm. the evening was the one that they put their passion into. Right. Is it like, there's a, a lesson for us all. Boy, no kidding, right? You put your passion into something and just let it go. Yeah. Is it sort of like in the music industry where, where you'll have a young artist that has a really catchy song and they sort of shoot out ahead, but there's nothing else there? You know, they've got ideas and concepts, but they haven't done the time to learn the craft. And so now it's like, well, what's next? Like, well, I, I, I had this short. It was, it won a couple of, you know. Right. Is that a similar kind of thing where they have to try to redefine themselves and, and they may stay in the business, but that may be their pinnacle moment, almost like a one hit wonder? I, th- I think that can happen. But I think, again, if you, that's why I'm kind of really glad that I kind of got into the business the way I did. Cause I, again, when I was younger, I was so naive about how the business works. I literally, th- you you just don't think about all the gatekeepers that like how many drafts of a script that it goes through and how every producer that comes on will have a you know completely have you rewrite the script sometimes and then an investor yeah. will come in and want you to rewrite the script and then an actor will come on and a direct and then there's that whole that process and then there's the filming and all the post production so you're a lot of times you're, when you're younger you're just very naive about the whole business so I think that you have to take the time to educate yourself but I I do think sometimes you know if people are thrust into things too soon and they, they don't have a good support system or especially family mm-hmm. um, support system around them. That's, that's where things can get really shaky. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of the students that I met at the LA film school, like their parents were very supportive, but their parents were very much regular parents. Like, and I've met like great stage parents right. and I've met awful stage parents where it's obviously like they're pushing their kid because they wanted to be famous and they weren't. Sure. Um, and those are the kids that end up getting into a lot of trouble and you know, people that are, that don't have that grounding at home, I think are the ones that they can have a more pr- hard time in the, in this business because, you know, the business doesn't really, business cares about what you do when you get to set, you mm-hmm. know, and how much money your movie makes and what you got next for them. And then whatever else is going on in your life, nobody, you know, they don't really care about unless it affects, right. You know, their bottom line, unless they're friends way, of yours. Yeah. And I was very fortunate cause I, you know, working at new line, you know, I kind of was raised by a, a, a group of friends. They could be gentle with you. 
but you still got to see a gr- you got to see the growth of new line cinema. Yeah. I mean there's no greater example where you could understand what it's like to be small and nimble and independent and then to have the power to get movies on screens. Yeah. And yeah. you were there right in the thick of all of it. Yeah. No, it was a I I I can never and I've met so many people like I always kind of joke that all roads lead to new line if you're above a certain age like i almost every other person i meet in the business somehow either interned at new line or did there there's some new line connection because it really was the place that everybody wanted to be back then because it was again it was it was so artist friendly and so just about the artist you know and the art of it and um yeah they wanted to make money but it was like again let's think outside the box and let's you know let's do movies that like target certain audiences so that we can take a risk, but we're not taking a huge financial risk because we know that this audience will come see it. Yeah. You guys did that well. Cause when I think about new line, I can picture the logo, which is really rare for a yeah. movie company to have that happen. There's others, but I picture that logo kind of flying in the bottom of the screen. And then the feeling I have is, okay, this is going to be good. Yeah. And I'm going to sit back in my chair. I know like I have faith in you know certain actors, but, very few studios do I have that, but yeah. I definitely have that feeling about New Line. This yeah. is going to be great. Yeah. And yeah. it's got turtles. <laughs> and it's got turtles. <laughs> and they're ninjas. It's a guy with razor blades <laughs> for razor fingers. Razor blades for fingers, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, you know, and again, they, I mean, the company, the company's not dead. You know, it's still, it's still around. It's sure. Just, it's just part of a bigger company now. And so it's But just, they built that brand on making great decisions and making an art, artistic choice over a financial choice. Absolutely. Right. And they're still, you know, they're still putting out good movies as well. Yes. But it's just that the... The wonderful family that I kind of grew up with um, isn't there any longer. It's just, you know, it's it was a sad day, you know. Mm-hmm. But you know, Bob Shea, who's still like just a genius, is off, you know, doing his his own thing with uh, Michael Lynn, who was um, at New Line as well. So they they mm-hmm. have their own company now, and so he's still out there. And as long as you know, as long as there are film lovers out there making movies, I always when people bemoan like the state of the movie industry, it's like as long as there are filmmakers who love film doing it. You know, there's always there will be something good. There'll be something good out there. You just it's, now you have to look for it more because there's so much clutter. Right. You know, you have to look for it more, and less and less and less of it has kid and play. Yeah, kid and play. <laughs> kid and like, play. I know together. Well, and it's fun, and it's funny because you know that's why part of me you know I've, that's why I've moved it more into producing and directing as well is because I've seen a lot of my films go from page to screen and and completely change. And oh. just as a horror fan, like you know, I know my. Horror. I know my stuff, you right. know, in the genre. So, you know, that's why I want to start having more creative control now. Will you tell us an example, uh, if you are contractually allowed, of one of those films where you went, mm, I didn't really write it like that? Well, Return to Cabin by the Lake was probably the, the biggest, mm-hmm. the biggest one for me. And it was a project. It was a sequel to Cabin by the Lake that had Judd Nelson in it. It was a TV movie, um, about a writer who was looking for inspiration. So he's murdering women, um, and, bi- burying them in a lake or dropping their bodies in a lake. So I got hired to write the sequel and was really pumped about it. I'm like, all right, I have to write a really good story so that Judd Nelson would want to come back. So I kind of wrote the story so that they were basically making a film based on the script that he was writing and the fact that he was really killing people. Um, and he kind of wormed his way on set. So it was, it was a little screamish, you know, a kind of self-aware kind of scream mm-hmm. story. But um, I worked really hard on the treatment with the producers and wrote the first draft of the script. And they actually greenlit the first draft of the script. Huh. But, that, but that's that's because we worked hard on the treatment. So, I'm not, you know, and they got the director on. They got Jed Nelson on. Everything was ready to go. And then I get a call from the producer that the head of USA Networks had reread the script on the plane and thought that it was too clever for their audience. So they, oh, wow. Yeah. So they, so they brought somebody in to kind of dumb down the, literally just dumb down the script. So it, it basically still has my scenes in the order that I wrote them, but everything is just kind of completely. The language down. isn't as sharp. The, it's the, not the, as. And, and there's no complexity to characters. So like, mm. you know, like in my version, like the director was in love with one of the actresses. So the other actors were like throwing themselves at him and he was just like, no, I'm, you know, I'm yeah. taken. And they're like, well, he should just be sleeping with all the actresses. I'm like, well, that's like, the most obvious, jo-. you know, so the, <laughs> Yeah, so when I watched that movie, they, the producer wouldn't even send me a copy of it beforehand. So that you know, that's a good. Sign. She's like, I can't, Jeffrey. I just can't send it to you. So wow. that was that was. I had my friends like come over to watch, it, and that was literally the only time. Like I, I you know, like that the Indian in that commercial when you litter, like where the chair goes. Yeah. Like I was, I was watching it, and that was that was me watching that movie because um, I think the director too. Because if you watch the first one, it actually is fun but suspenseful and mm-hmm. scary, and this one. 
the director shot it like a comedy. And I think part mm. of it's probably because he signed on for like a scary movie and then they rewrote it into something else. Right. And so now it's just, and it became of, dumb. So he might yeah, as well slapstick. It. Yeah. And so it's, it turned into like a slapstick movie actually. And you, you end up learning to love all your babies because at the end of the sure. day, yeah. at the end of the day, it, you're not stacking boxes. Yeah. You're and you're, movies. and you're making movies and yeah. you're doing what you love. And so there's a million people out there that would kill to get a movie made. So I, you know, right. I, I hate to even complain about anything about my movies that get changed. It still yeah, stings, no shit. Though. Like it, no, it, in, it does. And it it does. There's changes. <laughs> it just go with this, Jeffrey. It's going to be Judd Hirsch <laughs> <laughs> instead of Judd Nelson. And you're like, oh, okay. You know? So, you know, but, but the part that stings is when you write stuff and then, you know, you read reviews and all the stuff that, yeah. that they're raking the movie over the coals for is stuff that you didn't do. And you're like, and that's another reason why I want to direct is because I'm like, well, there's only so many times I can say that wasn't in my script before people are like, that, yeah, that's what that you guy always just, say. He's lying. Mm-hmm. That was in his script. He's just trying to not take the heat for it. Yeah. So, um, I figured I, you know, I want to direct my own stuff so that I can kind of bring my kind of vision to the screen. And that's where you're supposed to go, anyhow, right? I mean, you're supposed to evolve as yeah. an artist, and uh, you know, you're not just going to go play background roles. You're going to take more charge. You're going to produce. You're going to write. Yeah. You're going to direct. You're going to do all those things. Yeah. So it's um, it's a it's a fun journey. I always I always joke that I always do things probably about ten years a little late. You right. know. Which is fine. <laughs> yeah. But, but, you know, like, I, di- I didn't leave New Line when I sold the first script. You know, right. like, most people would have went to L.A. I stayed in New York yeah. and didn't move out to L.A. when I sold the first script. I waited till I sold the story for the second one to finally leave New Line. Because, um, I, you know, I just, I love working there so much. And I'm very much a creature of habit. So I'll I'll stay in a, kind of my comfort zone for, for a long time before I find, like, you know what, all right, mm-hmm. life's too short, you know. Yeah. Um, Do you prefer New York still over LA or? Um, I know sometimes people get a flavor of one and it. You know what? Here's, I, I love growing up in New York and I, I love the city. Um, it's hard. I left because of 9-11. I lived mm-hmm. downtown near the World Trade Center when that happened and I was home and it was, mm-hmm. um, you know, so I, I, I left under not the best circumstances. Um, and so I love going back there, but when I've gone back there, it's always been like in the middle of summer where it's like sweltering hot. And so I feel like just like grumpy old man going down the sidewalks going, oh, I can't move too many people. I'm sweating. Eh. Um, so, you know, I, it's such a cliche, but I love the, the weather out here is amazing. Yeah. Like I, I just love the weather out here, um, in Los Angeles. And, and I, and I love the, the pacing of it because it's, it's busy, but it's not like overwhelmingly hustle bustle. Mm-hmm. So now I kind of like here better, but I, I still love New York. I, I mean, I, I spent so many years there and, mm-hmm. you know, I, it kind of molded me. Yeah. You know, can, it, you know, going from Kentucky to New York to LA, it's just been like such a interesting, a mix. interesting mix of, yeah. you know, places and people that made me who I am today. So that is just about everything. No <laughs> I mean, in terms of pace and in terms of just the amount of rat race you're dealing with and, and all that, that's just about everything. If New York informs, uh, what you're writing still. How long have you been in LA? Um, I, uh, since 9 11, so I've been here 15. Oh, you 15 really years. did, like right after 9 11, you said, I'm out. Yeah, well, I tried to stay for two months, but we lived, um, in Battery Park City and, um, our apartment building was right off the, um, wow. off the water. So they, they were bringing barges down and taking rubble mm. from the World Trade Center and putting them on the, like 24 7. Right. So, you know, we had You lived in, in the midst and, of it. Yeah, so you just couldn't get away from it. And so I, I lasted for like two months and I'm like, I, I've, I've got to get out of here. So when you moved here to LA, what'd you do? Um, I just wrote. Yeah, okay. I got, a, got got an apartment. You know, I I just sold the um, uh, Final Destination two. So you, know, you had, had a little time, had a little nest egg together. So I you know I moved out here and uh, just started writing. Uh, I got an agent, um, some managers, and um, yeah, just started going out. You know, the funny the you know the funny thing is since I didn't come out right after Final Destination mm-hmm. and I wasn't here to kind of you know, do, do the tour of the town. Most people didn't know who I was, mm. you know, because the director and his writing partner were out here kind of taking right. all the meetings. Um, and so when I moved out here, they're like, oh, we didn't know that you worked on it. I'm like, uh, my name's like story and screenplay. <laughs> First. Like, um, yeah. yeah. It's like twice on the poster. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm on IMDb. Um, so I kind of had to, IMDb. I almost, <laughs> so I almost had to reintroduce myself um, to, huh. to the town when I moved out here. Um, which again is I I don't regret it all. I mean, again, it's, it's a every, great everything's exercise. Just part huh? of yeah, everything's just part of you know a journey. So, um, 
so yeah, I just, it was kind of, it wasn't starting all over, but it was almost starting kind of as a new, as a newbie in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, a newbie, but a newbie who had wrote this hit. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. it wasn't like he came out here with nothing. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Like, I've yeah. got this old suitcase and my dreams. Like, yeah, oh, actually, I've, I've, I've actually I've got made a franchise some. my yeah. dreams. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was, you know, it was, it, it, did, it was very helpful and did open up a lot of doors for me, but I, I was for all of the, all the great stuff I did learn at New Line, like I was very much in a bubble there because I kind of came in at a young age and, you know, everybody knew the Bob Shea story. You know, Bob would tell it at Christmas parties. He always changed the story though. He kept saying that I harassed him and he had to, he had to like write me something. And I was like, I did. That's not how it happened, Bob. <laughs> That's a better story though. But, yeah. So, but, um, but let's yeah, let that happen. Got, but I got kind of spoiled, you know, cause sure. I, I worked at a, the studio and I think maybe in my whole, 11 years of working there, I maybe got yelled at like twice by somebody right. in an industry where people scream at everybody. There wasn't a lot of, sc- there weren't a lot of screamers at New Line, but you know, just in general, you know, like, mm-hmm. you know, people wouldn't scream at me because I was like Bob Shea's guy, you know? Right. Um, so I got really spoiled and, and so I didn't really have to ever work the town, you know what I'm saying? And go out and network and do things sure. like that. So I had to come out here and kind of learn that, which was a whole new game for me. So what can you tell us about that you're working on next? I have a project at uh, Lionsgate Code Black, like a slasher film. That's a kind of a multicultural slasher film that I can't reveal the plot of. But we just actually this week I found out we're um, are signing a directors. I can't say who they are because I li- literally a half an hour before. <laughs> but I got it is here, a really exciting time. Yeah, no, like I literally half an hour before I got over here, I got a call from the producer. It's like that we're signing a director. So I'm really excited about it. it's. It's one of my favorite projects, and it's just going to be an. Great, because I haven't had, I haven't written a fun slasher film, um, or had one made. So this how is, is it a multicultural slasher film? Um, you know, we intentionally wrote it so that it was a diverse cast. Like that's been a big thing for me. It's not as big of a deal now as it, as it used to be, but even when I wrote Final Destination, I'm biracial, and I was like, look, we're in New York City, like the most diverse city in the world. Like, yeah. So let's not cast a bunch of just all white characters for the movie. And you know, guess what they did? They cast all white people in the movie, and then they're like. Oh, Tony Todd. There, we'll put Tony Todd in there, and a detective, <laughs> a Latino detective. And there we go. I think he's Latino. So, it, but it, you know, like it's it's all white kids, and it's yeah. like that's not New York. So I've always tried to write diversity into my scripts, and most of the time it's not happened. <laughs> you know, which is which is fine. It's just you know, I I specifically wanted to write a movie because I feel like you know the Latino and African American audiences are are they're huge horror fans. But they're wildly underrepresented, and yeah. you know it's always the running joke about how the black guy gets killed first. And even when they joke about that movies, they'll still kill him first in the movies. And for me, it's like I wanted to write a movie that because if, for me, horror fans will go out and see a good film. They just care about the story, the scares, the concept, and the characters. Like they don't care who's in it. Right. It's kind of Hollywood has this idea that it you know you have to have mostly white people, or it's not going to travel. And until somebody does something to prove them wrong they're not going to be proven wrong. And a lot of the films that have been directed towards audiences like that has been like, well, Leprechaun in the hood or, mm-hmm. you know, a vampire in Brooklyn. Oh it's like, God. you know, but it's like, it's, it's you just said a Leprechaun in the hood. No, there's two. There were two of them. <laughs> yeah. Leprechauns there two with of, attitude. There were two of them. Wow. There were two Leprechauns in the hood, uh, but that's <laughs> kind of been people's <laughs> answers to, even know that existed. To, oh yeah. The, <laughs> I think it's a, and then he, but then he went to space after that. <laughs> well, well, of course, cause that's that where you space. go next. That, after, yeah. after the hood, you know where to go but space. But, um, what, so, what about the Leprechaun though? Was he, a leprechaun who traveled to the hood yeah. or was he a, th- a character who grew up in the hood and no. discovered that he was a leprechaun? No, he was a leprechaun and somebody from the hood stole his See, gold. I, I had a little hood like an O'Malley guy, but he's black. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know how I got this last name, but I'm, I'm a leprechaun, damn I'm it. A leprechaun, yeah, yeah, I just found out that I'm a leprechaun and I'm coming to terms with my racial identity <laughs> by putting on this tiny green jacket. Yeah. It's a coming of age story. Um, of a, yes, of a black Irishman. Leprechaun in the right. He's black. <laughs> um, and they made two of those things. They made two because the first one did so well. Yeah. But, and that's, and that part of that is because again, I think the audiences are so underserved, um, mm. that, um, it's kind of like with, with gay films. Like they could have done anything in the hood, leprechaun yeah. or not. Yeah. And you would, you would get a, certain core audience there but what i wanted to do was to make a film where 
the majority of the cast happened to be multicultural, just like Fast and the Furious. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. You know, it sure did work for Fast and it, Furious. It did, and it's just, and it's not about that. It's just you know nobody's sitting around going, "Hey, look, I'm African American and I'm Latino and I'm blah blah blah." You know, it's just these are a group of friends that are diverse. Let's find a Puerto Rican and yeah. hang out with him. Yeah. <laughs> right. It just happened to it be just, like you said. It was you're ta- you're describing New York. That's just it's just New like York. life. It's yeah. you know my I, I, I my friends or people used to joke at me. My group of friends because. It was like me, and then I had my best friend who was Italian, and I had my other friend from, white guy from Kentucky, and then I had my Jewish friend from the Bronx, and I had my, um, Native American friend, and I had my Asian friend. It like, but we all hung out. We were like the UN, and we just, yeah. it wasn't like, we just all just hung out together. It wasn't like we planned it, you know, it's just right. like, that's how, and so when I write, I try to, because people are just people at the end of the day. Like, right. we all have different experiences that in, inform who we are, but, um, but it's more fun, isn't it? I mean, because it's not to stereotype, but there are things that happen with responses that are based on cultural yeah. stuff. And you can say that, okay, well, you know, I didn't write this stereotypically so the Indian dude would do, break out into a Bollywood dance when he got scared or whatever. Right. Or somebody would show this brother a magic trick and he'd run around in a circle. Right. <laughs> it's all, although we know that happens. Yes. But, you know, you do start to write for... It's like now I don't have to write for these five, you know, white characters that don't represent me and my friends or, you know, whatever. You're not, you're not limited. Right. And that's the thing is that it was a limitation for what you could write or what would inform the writing. Right. And now we're in a day and age where much more is accepted and you can go, yeah, sure. We'll throw in a character that does that or is from that or. Right. You know. Yeah. And it, it really is. I think it's just about people are people. And so if you make characters relatable who who happen to be of a different race or who happen to be gay or, you know, this character happens to be a woman or this character happens to be a Christian or a Muslim or whatever, it's like that's what scary life is, is still scary. That's <laughs> but and, that's what but that's what life is. That's yeah. what life is like. You know, we try it. You know, it's you know, I don't like in this in this film, like there's a there's a gay character as well. And it's like he's not. Nobody makes a big deal about it. You yeah. know, he's just like there and he just happens to be gay, yeah. you know? And it's like, I think when, if you try too hard to like bang people have with a message about something, like we're trying to be diverse here, right. then that kind of dilutes the movie. But, you know, for this one, I just wanted to write a really strong, scary slasher film mm-hmm. where the characters just happen to, to be like, you know, ethnically diverse and right. not all white. And I, we kill some white people. That's, Thank goodness. So, so, yeah. So As just, the token know. white guy, I want to say <laughs> yes. And all, and all miraculously were very scared when somebody came out and chased them around with an axe. <laughs> Imagine that. I know. It doesn't matter what race you are. You still get scared and run. Yeah. Um, and you fall down. And that one girl's going to show her titties. Yes. <laughs> that's what always happens. So, you know, that's that project I'm really excited. I mean, I'm excited about all my stuff. You know, we just finished shooting a film and in Texas about sleep paralysis called dead awake that, um, that we just finished post on. And that's terrifying. It is. It is. And it's, I mean, I don't know what any of the plot devices are and I don't know what any of the, you just said you made a film about sleep paralysis and that mm-hmm. terrifies me. Yes. No, it's, it's a really good film and it's a great, it's, it's I didn't know how many people knew about sleep paralysis mm-hmm. until I started working on this film. Um, cause I didn't know, I'd had it, but I didn't know what it was. Until I started researching this, and um, so I'm really excited about that. You know, where you'd had sleep paralysis, yeah, but not like the just more where I would wake up and I couldn't move for a minute, and I'd just be like, "What the hell?" And then I would finally move, but I never had the thing where I saw something sitting on my chest or felt like something evil was in the room with me. I never had any of the the terrifying stuff that I hear I've heard other people. uh, um, You're just like, man, I can't reach my slurpee right now. I know (laughs) that makes me sad. (laughs) (laughs) My nose is itching. I can't scratch it. So that one, I'm, you know, I'm really excited about that because I just think it's such a, you know, almost like Final Destination. It's like, and, you know, it's got a t- flavor of Nightmare on Elm Street to it in a way, but yeah. it's, it's something that, again, you were, you know, you only die once, but you have to go to sleep every night. So it's like something that I really think it will resonate with people. Mm. And, um, I directed a short called Good Samaritan, uh, that's about a group of people who witness somebody being assaulted and don't help. And a video wow. gets out, video gets out of the witnesses and they start dying. And our lead character, is convinced that something supernatural, like his spirit or, or karma or something, is after them. But you don't know if it's a killer or supernatural until the very end. And mm. um, uh, I shot a short on it, and we're, we're actually getting ready to produce a feature version of that that I'll be directing. So I'm really pumped about that. A- another project, um, a book adaptation called The Undertakers, which is a YA book by an author named Ty uh, Drago. And it's a it's about an alien invasion movie. It's an alien invasion movie, but the aliens um, are energy that use the 
bodies of corpses as hosts. Hmm. And they're able to project these masks. It's almost a little like they live because they project these masks, so they look like normal people. Right. Um, but these groups of kids, once they start hitting puberty, start getting the sight and they can pick them out. So that aliens so are it's not to, that they ran across some sunglasses. No, they, yeah. no sunglasses. But I hope, yeah, no sunglasses. But and Rowdy Roddy Piper. I know. In a mood to fight. But, um, you know, it, for me it's exciting because it's, it's a young adult movie, but it's not like a dystopian future kind of like what we've seen in the other ones. It's set here and now in modern times with kids who are like, can only fight with the things at their disposal and they're dealing with a real, th- uh, like a terrifying kind of threat. So it's a weird, you know, it's a kind of a walking dead meets they mm-hmm. live kind of YA movie. So that's another movie I'm really pumped about. And you know, there's some TV projects I'm working on. There's, oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> You're a well. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, it's, it's been all, but all this stuff. It's like, you know, you just have to keep busy mm-hmm. because a lot of my friends are like, well, how do you stay motivated? I'm like, well, survival um <laughs> yeah and, i like and, to eat and, and i also don't want to you know and I, as much as i love final destination like i don't want to milk that cow till i'm like 90 sure you, you got know. other things you want to I, tell. Got, I have other cows i want to milk yes. and um i want all the <laughs> put all the cows out to pat i'm trying to save that conversation from going in a bad direction but i can't so i'm just gonna stop yeah but um <laughs> there's no good others, that's gonna come have, with this i have other stories that i want to tell um and that i'm really excited about telling and but they've been things that i've been working on for a long time so the reason I say that is because even though it, a lot's happened, it feels like a lot's happening right now. These are all things that I've been working on for like years and years and years. So right. it takes, it takes a long time. Like Final Destination was a very fast and unique thing because I sold, I sold that to New Line in 97, 96, 97, 97, and it came out in 2000. Hmm. So that's in, in movie time, that's a very quick fast. turnaround yeah. from like yeah, buying, a, buying a treatment right to script phase to shooting. To having a film out, and it usually takes a lot longer, you know. And so, and a lot the benefit of benefit of being there in the nimble environment of New Line when you were, yeah. And it and it taught me patience, and it taught me, you, you know, you just have to keep keep putting out work and keep writing. And sometimes you end up visiting a project, you know, and it's ten years after you wrote the script before somebody reads it and it's like, oh, I want to make this, you know. So so you have a stack of stuff, you know, and you're still making new stuff. So it's it's. You just keep busy. That's all you can do is keep your head down and keep busy and try to work as ethically as you can and treat people well. And make hay when the sun shines. <laughs> and make hay, yeah. I want to ask you about your process when you write because there's such creativity in Final Destination, you know, with death being a character, but you never see it. Uh, the way people die. How do you, when you write, do you just sit down or does it just come out? Or do you get inspired when you go to Starbucks and you see something you're like, oh, Okay, I'm going to turn that into something, and it just kind of resides in your brain until you need it, and then it comes out. How do you do it? You know, it's it's different for everybody. I know with with Final Destination, um, I read an article on, a, on an airplane like, uh, where this woman was on vacation, and um, her mother called her and told her not to take the flight home. She was supposed mm, to take home the next right. day, and she changed flights, and the the flight that she was supposed to be on crashed. So I remember reading that story. I was actually on a plane going home to Kentucky, and that story just stuck me. I was like, Oh, that's really creepy. Like, you know, wow, she meant she missed, she, she to death. And, but I, I, it didn't immediately occur to me to like turn that into a, a mm-hmm. movie idea. Right. What happened was when I wanted to get a TV agent, you know, they always tell you to write something for something that's on television. So X files was like my favorite show at the time. And so I used that idea as mm-hmm. an X files episode just to get an agent. I never sent it out. There's like, it's always funny when you get on Wikipedia and you read all this stuff, it's like, Oh, this was submitted. This was a rejected X file script. It's like, no, I actually didn't send it to the X files. Um, but one of my friends, Mark Kaufman at new line read the TV thing. And he's like, this is a great idea. You should write this as a feature. Hmm. Um, so then I wrote it as an, you know, an outline as a feature. And originally they were all adults. Right. And then Kevin Williamson and I, he, I'm dear friends with them. So I love them to death, but damn him. When scream came out, which I love, they're like, Oh, we make them all teenagers. Because, you know, teenagers became hot again. So then all of a sudden they went from being adults who didn't know each other to being a class full of teenagers, which is fine. Yeah. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but it was a process, you know. And um, like for the second movie, it was funny. We were trying to think of an opening and I had was going to do a hotel fire. And the producer was just like, oh, it's just not, you know, it's just not as exciting, you know, it's, as it could be. And I was back home in Kentucky again for the holidays and um, got behind one of those log trucks. Mm-hmm. Friggin' hate those. Oh, I yeah. Pulled, I pulled around the log truck. I was like shit and i pulled off the side of the road and i call craig perry and i'm like craig log truck on a freeway and the ch- and the chain breaks logs and he's like that's it that's it and that's how the opening of that movie started so that was kind of inspiration for that but um mm. for good samaritan the, the inspiration for that was um the kitty genevieve story which is um a woman in in new york and this was 
Oh, I'm going to screw the dates up. This was back in the 70s, I think, 60s or 70s. And um, it was a woman who was assaulted. Um, and the story at the time was she was assaulted in, in the um, quad area of her apartment complex. And all these people witnessed it. And nobody helped. Right. And and they've since debunked the story because it turns out that there were some people that did call the police. And the police came, but the suspect had left. You know, there was just a lot of bad timing things that happened. But a reporter kind of went down to interview people and realized that he could get the most mileage out of a story about Hundreds of witnesses heard this woman screaming for help and didn't help her. Mm. And that's a story that I heard. And so that story always really stuck with me about how people could not do that. And I stayed it up on the bystander effect and all this stuff. And, um, you know, I always thought that would be the interesting starting off point for a story. Hmm. You know, so th- there are obviously many ways you could take it. You could turn it into like a ghost story. You could turn it into a revenge killer story. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, a producer that... Uh, worked on it with me was like, why don't we do it where you don't know what story it is, where it feels like it's a supernatural thing, but it could be real and you don't reveal till the end what it is. And so it was the hardest script for me to write because I couldn't kind of rely on my slasher bag of tricks or my supernatural bag of tricks because right. it had to be stuff that worked either way once you go back and watch the movie again. But it's, it's, it's probably the script that I'm most proud of because it, I think it's right up there with, you know, conceptually it's up there with Final Destination, but it's what I love about the horror genre is like you can ask deeper questions than just, you know, it's not just about killing people in movies. Yeah. Usually there, for me, I like, I like to have other things going on in the movies. And for this one, you have characters that are really wrestling with like, you know, some people had very selfish reasons for not helping this person get us, who was getting assaulted. But, you know, and so does, are they just as guilty as everybody else? And of course, the outside world, they are like, you just watch a video of these people standing around and you're like, damn those people, how could they do that? And, but you get to know them and you hear their motivations and you start to hopefully sympathize with some of them. Um, and it makes you think, you know, hopefully, you know, if we, movie's done, it's done right. People will kind of leave the theaters, you know, thinking twice about, you know, not helping somebody, but it, in the movie, they don't help and they die. And so I don't know if, I don't know when I want to, if people are going to be like, I don't want to die, so I'm not going to help. <laughs> but yeah, so that, that, that's what inspired me from that. So I, I do take some stuff from real life. Um, but again, like for me, the things that I love about, you know, like Nightmare on Elm Street, it, 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 you know, or the fan, the fantasy horror. I love supernatural kind of fantasy, um, and, and mixing, you know, messing with reality and people's perceptions of reality. Um, I'm working with this French company, uh, you media on a, on a project too, that kind of deals with like the dream world in a way. And it's really just a, that, that kind of stuff always excites me, like fantasy horror. Those are the scary things when the lines are blurred, you know, because we all feel safest when everything's clearly defined. And when you're like, wait a minute, that's kind of supernatural that, you know, I don't have definitions for that. That could happen. Um, that's terrifying. Right. That's what made Fantasy Island kind of scary to me. Fantasy Island's aw- I know. That was It was awesome so short. Show. Anybody could die at any time. Yep. And it was supernatural. Like, you know, how's he doing this? Yeah. Wait, oh, my God. It was terrifying for that little 15-minute piece, you know? Didn't they try to remake that? I think they did, but it just wasn't. Yeah, it seemed like that. I thought they never remade it, but it was, like a che- it was going to be more of a cheesier version. Because that's what I love about Fantasy Island. Because sometimes they would be really scary. Yes. And then sometimes they wouldn't be, but it was like... And there were no rules. Like, you didn't know what kind of ride you were getting on. It was just, you were going to get on a roller coaster. Yep. You know? It's like... "Ah." Uh, I remember that show. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, why is this part... This segment is so dark, and it's Ruth Buzzy. Yeah. (laughs) What's going on there? Yeah, and Ricardo Montalban had that little bit of darkness in him. Yeah. You know, where you're like, oh, why is he doing this to people? You know? It It was a cool show. Yeah. I just, you know, I had a hard time with the fact that it was called Fantasy Island and there wasn't a threesome every week. Oh. There wasn't? <laughs> I'm just oh. saying. Yeah. Just an observation. It's, it's like, just, hey, I, you can go to an island and have your fantasy. Ding! I yeah. know what I want. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but, the, but I think threesomes were like, that wasn't, didn't that start being a thing in like the 90s? I'm kidding. Like, Fantasy oh. Island was came out, like, when was that? I don't know what the fantasies were back then. Well, they, uh, <laughs> you know, they would feature sometimes the, uh, the Lander sisters. Lander sisters. Yeah. 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 They'd you get go. off a love boat and go, yeah. I know where the Fantasy ahead. Island and Charo would be there. Oh, that's what I would love the most. And that's one of the things about the horror genre that I like in that it's contained and its fans are its fans and you can do things like that. I like the cross pollination. Like any time that there was an opportunity to get off of the love boat because it docked at Fantasy Island, you know, yeah. I love this concept that we can do things in the horror genre because it's more like it belongs to the community yeah and you can do things that mess with people and then somebody takes it another step and you can kind of borrow 
what scared you from something else and, and, and expand on it. What about this? I hear there's this movie there that somebody's trying to make that is employing all of like Robert England's in it and all the, everybody who played a villain, not that they get to license their character, but right. somebody's trying to sell this film on, Hey, we've got all of the actors that played it's all like of the, the untouchables classic. Are the, uh, and that's how they're billing it. That. Expendables of that. horror. Yeah, yeah. I heard about that. Well, I know they're also, there's, um, and I think one maybe, maybe shot already, but they're, they're doing one kind of version of that with Scream Queens as well, where they're trying to, you know, bring in all these final girls together for a, for a movie. And I, I always think that that's, that's cool. I just, you know, you want to, I want to see, I, I want to see how they utilize them, you know, like, yeah. it's, you know, and who gets to be the final, who's the champion of yeah, the like final Yeah, Like you have girls, all the final right? girls together, Which but one it's ends up in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> that one's always happened too. Wow, man. Well, we're excited for you and we appreciate you being on our show oh, and we've for had me. you for an hour and can we, can we get an update? Can we do it again? Of Was course. This? Yeah, absolutely. Nice. Yeah. No, only, you only get one hour. That's it. I'm like, a, I'm like a high priced hooker. You only get one hour with me and, um, <laughs> And that's all. Well, well no, that doesn't make. Here. I got to think yeah. of another. I got to. Yeah, that's why it's I don't always write, a good day. That's when why I don't write comedy. You, you and know, your that's cows why I do and not, your high price hookers. Me and my milk and the cows and the hookers. It's like, uh, <laughs> that's why I don't do comedy. It's a day um, in life at Pete's house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, absolutely would be would love to come back on the show. Hey, you know what? You just passed up Florence Henderson as my favorite Kentuckian. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah. There you are. So now, but you've climbed up the ladder and you are our show's favorite Kentuckian. Yes. Yay. <laughs> next, if we get Johnny Depp be, on the show. Next, I must be the, your favorite in the world. So if we get Johnny Depp on the show, you might be in oh. trouble. <laughs> <laughs> he might just break out into some crazy profundity and we'll go, wow, oh. that was really heavy. <laughs> so you might have just Jeff passed up yeah, that. Screw Reddick. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, man. All right. Thank yeah, you, guys. Man. All right. 